Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Parkin. The silky smooth sounds of the Green and Red podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin, in uh, Berkeley, California today. And as always, I'm joined by uh, Bob Bazanko in my last days in the uh, really nice climate of Ohio. So, yeah, yeah, I wish I could say that about the, here. We actually had a uh, little bit of a fire and the, it was <laughs> full of toxic smoke this morning. So that's that's the world we're living in these days. Uh, but to get started, uh, you know, we have a, an exciting episode today. Uh, you know, we've done multiple episodes on this, but we're especially excited about the guest we have, who is, uh, uh, has, a, has a lot of knowledge about what we're going to talk about, which is, you know, we're in the midst of a, a serious rollback of First Amendment, First Amendment protected activities, states are passing anti-protest legislation, police are becoming increasingly militarized, surveillance is uh, increasing on activist groups and people who aren't even activists. Uh, and so we've covered these issues with a number of people, like journalists like Will Parrish and Trevor Aronson, but also our comrades Jake Conroy and Daniel McGowan have been on talking about some of this. And so today we're joined by Will Potter, uh, long intro. Uh, Will is a uh, thought leader and investigative journalist whose work is focused on social justice and environmental movements and attacks on their civil rights post 9-11. Uh, Will is also the author of Green is the New Red, which kind of fits with the Green and Red podcast, I, I just got to say. Um, an insider's account of social movements uh, under siege. It came out probably in like 2011. Um, this is my copy of it right here. Uh, but uh, Will is also a distinguished journalist in residence and civil rights fellow with the University of Denver Animal Law Program. But Will, welcome to the Green and Red podcast. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we can just kind of kick off, um, you know, I uh, think, I mean, there's a lot of things that, I, I, that we're hoping to talk about today, both past and, and kind of more current events, but maybe we could actually just start with your background a little bit. Um, could you, could you actually talk about what got you interested in this topic? I know that you have been involved in the, in the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty campaign, uh, but you were also working as a journalist at the time, but maybe kind of start from there and give us a little bit of a background. Sure. Uh, yeah, in the mid to late 90s, I got involved in and was pursuing both a career in traditional journalism, which at that time meant newspaper reporting, because uh, we still had some of those around, and also was getting heavily involved in activism. And it felt what, you know, kind of at a, felt like a crossroads, felt more of a crossroads then than it, than it actually was, perhaps. Um, but I kept on that traditional journalism path, wanted to end up at someplace like the Washington Post or New York Times. Um, and the reality was, it was just chewing me up. Um, the darkness of the beat, the kind of endless shootings and murders and school board meetings reporting that didn't really go anywhere. Um, so when I was in Chicago, I had a temporary reporting assignment at the Chicago Tribune. And like you said, I had been active in the Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty campaign. This was a campaign and I was doing a lot of human rights work at the time as well, but this was a campaign I was really drawn to because there had been multiple undercover investigations that had exposed this lab, doing things like researchers punching beagle puppies in the face because they were frustrated, they couldn't get a vein, um, dissecting live monkeys, just really over the top egregious stuff that at that time, this kind of early internet era um, was mind blowing to me. Um, these were exposés that were being passed around on VHS tapes and at activist conferences. And so to put a long story short, I, I got really inspired by seeing what was happening with that campaign to shut down this lab. <clears throat> and when I was in the, the midst of it at the Tribune, just feeling especially dark and hopeless and what the hell am I doing with journalism, I decided to go out leafleting. Um, we hung a bunch of door knockers in kind of a richy rich neighborhood outside of Chicago, where some of these executives associated with the lab and banks tied to the lab lived. Um, and of course, we were all arrested. <laughs> we were all, uh, the charges were thrown out, but kind of the significance of that period for me um, was that I was visited by several FBI agents um, in the wake of that who threatened to put me on a domestic terrorist list 
unless I helped by infiltrating and spying on protest groups. Um, the language they used was, you know, I was the kind of more respectable one of the group. I had the job at the Tribune and I had a, a decent apartment with my girlfriend at the time. And, you know, I had the resume and the grad school and all this stuff. And they saw it as an opportunity to try to, to try to get in um, and to try to instill that fear. And I, it was the starting point of, uh, of an obsession for me, not just the personal aspect, I guess that was kind of a catalyst, um, but trying to understand the scope of what was happening and how just a few months after 9-11, this was already the climate of the FBI going after explicitly nonviolent protest groups, people that were just hanging door knockers. And, and uh, you know, the, you know, I, I was uh, rereading, I've been rereading your book a little bit over, over the past week. And the, and the, I mean, and so one, this is, this is in the period sort of post 9-11, um, 2001. And then, and then two, they, they were really sort of like amping up the pressure on you, weren't they? Weren't they like, you know, going to your job and, and, and things like that. They were really sort of trying to kind of turn the screws a little bit. Yeah, going to the job, talking to the landlord. Um, they knew all kinds of, you know, I had to get, I was 22 or something. I had to get my parents to co-sign on the apartment because I didn't have any money. So they knew all about that. So then they brought in like family pressure. They brought in um, my girlfriend at the time had PhD funding. I had Fulbright applications pending that, you know, it's all these things that I don't know if I didn't get it because I'm just not smart enough and I didn't have the creds or you didn't get it because somebody made a phone call and they really played into that narrative. Um, and then it continued to kind of follow me um, with typical stuff that a lot of people at this time had issues with traveling, especially traveling internationally. But really what I experienced was not bad at all. I mean, in the scheme of things and certainly in the scheme of what um, I focused on in my reporting. The the big takeaway for me though was how the FBI and law enforcement uses this kind of low level um, attacks, these, this kind of campaign of attrition to wear down activists, to make them afraid, to make them second guess themselves and each other. Um, you know, I, I talk about a little bit in the book that when this happened, like I had read all this stuff about COINTELPRO in the 60s and 70s. I knew about the history of the FBI and private security forces going after social movements. You know, we all want to think that we're going to respond a certain way. And I was really embarrassed by how much it scared me. You know, I didn't know what my job prospects were. And that kind of scared me that the FBI was talking in this way. Um, and also I was reluctant to not reluctant, but I didn't know how to talk to my co-defendants and to my girlfriend and my friends and other people about it. Um, that Even though I'd been through like security workshops and things like that as a journalist and as an activist, I just didn't feel really equipped. Um, I feel, felt like things escalated very quickly. And um, I felt like I was left kind of scrambling. So uh, a big part of my motivation for the book and, and a lot of my work in my career is trying to acknowledge those types of fears um, as normal and, and also to recognize the incapacitating nature of them. I mean, if we're going to talk about state repression, fear and the power of fear is the currency. I mean, that, that's what these law enforcement agencies deal with, and that's their kind of marching order. When I think or teach about surveillance and repression, I mean, it starts with labor groups or civil rights groups, groups considered on the left or whatever. But in the earlier period, not so much environmental groups, but clearly after, especially after 911, what do you think made that flip? Was it just that 911 became such a huge opportunity for all levels of surveillance? Or were there kind of more particular uh, pressures? That, that led to, you know, kind of surveillance of groups like Shaq and, and others? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that I really struggled with. Um, I think it's tempting to view 9-11 as this fulcrum moment, right? Where everything changed. We certainly saw that of all of a sudden uh, police and law enforcement and 
racist mobs going after Muslim and uh, Arab American people. What I found in my research, though, in terms of how this happened with protest groups, is it started decades before. Um, the war on environmentalists and, like you mentioned, the war on social justice movements more broadly has existed as long as these movements have, have existed. And the efforts to use 9-11 were really as a, as a catalyst. So in other words, all of these campaigns were going on since the 80s. These industry groups made up this word eco-terrorism. They just made it up. And throughout the 80s and even into the 90s, they didn't get a lot of traction on that. Um, in part because if you think about the political climate at the time in the 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s, the news coverage of terrorism was quite a bit different, right? The, we're talking about hijackings and hostage situations, uh, bombings. And so these efforts to label tree-hugging environmentalists in the press didn't really get anywhere. The press didn't really bite on that public relations narrative and frankly, in my research, um, found that they called it out quite a bit and instead regarded these protests as heroes, vigilantes, e eco warriors, monkey wrenchers, and language like that. The fascinating thing I found in the congressional record around September 11th is that as emergency crews were still trying to save people in New York and in Washington, D.C., as the smoke literally had not cleared and people are still buried under the rubble, you had members of Congress standing up and speculating openly in Congress that it was the work of environmentalists, the Earth Liberation Front, and anarchists, which for your listeners, I'm sure know this, but there's never been a history like that in these movements, nothing like that, nothing even close to this had ever happened. Um, and in fact, these movements have a long history of explicitly supporting sabotage, but stopping short of physical violence. And to me, that kind of summarized everything, right? They saw this moment, they immediately leaned into it. And I guess to answer your question, it was a mix of a few things happening. I think that was the immediate aftermath of, of 9-11. And then in my interviews with FBI agents, what I came to feel is that um, in the subsequent years and, and decades now, policies that became that began as really a fringe movement by corporations became mainstreamed. And a lot of the reason they were mainstreamed within government is because everyone wanted to look tough on terrorism. Um, you know, one FBI agent told me, you know, in the 70s uh, or into the 80s, it was the war on drugs. Uh, now it's the war on terrorism. And if you want to have career advancement, you, you know, you want to get the gold star in the FBI, you want to uh, have job prospects and move up or go into private industry, you got to show that you're tough on terrorism. Um, and as Trevor Aronson, somebody who's been on your show, a friend of mine, uh, has talked about and investigated extensively, that led to manufacturing terrorism threats uh, to show that these agents were able to be tough in that way. So it's a few things happening. Um, it's kind of seizing the opportunity. And then now, you know, gearing up for 2024, it really feels like all of this has taken on a life of its own to the point where um, I think a lot of people in law enforcement and FBI don't even know where this came from, why it's happening, why they're doing it, um, but they're following orders. You know, one one thing that strikes me is that there's a sort of like parallel track of, you know, you know, there's where uh, uh, the uh, it was um, Mueller or uh, or Comey actually came out and it was post, you know, not too long after 9-11, they came out and said that the, you know, Shack and Earth Liberation Front were the, you know, the biggest terrorist threats to the, to the United States. But then we're also, you know, during this period in some of the period 90s 80s 90s we're also seeing this like sort of right-wing terrorism and you know we have the Oklahoma oh, yeah. City bombing and we have you know lots of things like that and I know that the right was a little bit thrown into disarray after that but still you know what what did you what do you see what did your research show around like what the FBI was doing around like some of the right-wing groups you know while they you know they're chasing after Shaq and the Earth Liberation Front but and the Animal Liberation Front but like what were they doing around the sort of the threat of the right, the right wing terror? Yeah, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of times I've been really shocked 
in my reporting and investigations, but this was one of them. Um, I started going down the rabbit hole of inspector general reports, internal FBI data sets, um, congressional testimony, FBI memos, leaked documents. And through it all, what is unmistakably clear is that during this entire period that the FBI is ramping up alongside of its uh, corporate allies, this campaign against nonviolent environmentalists, as you said, even testifying that they're the number one domestic terrorism threat they are repeatedly and deliberately ignoring, downplaying, and delegitimizing the threat of right-wing violence. So to put this in perspective, uh, what, what's especially shocking, for instance, there was one report where the Inspector General of the Department of Justice sent this report to the FBI, and it was pretty scathing. Uh, and it said, you know, you're focusing on low-level social pro protesters. If you keep doing this, it raises the specter and possibility of actual right-wing violence growing and taking hold. You need to change your focus. And instead the FBI wrote back and they're just like, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, there wasn't a, you know, a big uh, speechifying moment of their explaining the ideological threat of eco-terrorism. It was just as simple as that. Like we're not gonna change our policies. And it's not just the FBI. So as the FBI was doing this, you have the Department of Homeland Security and also post 9-11, the rise of what are called fusion centers, which are these conflations of state, local and federal law enforcement um, to share information, right? And the information they're sharing is overwhelmingly and disproportionately about anti-war, global justice, environmentalist, Catholic worker, uh, food not bombs, groups like this, and repeatedly ignoring and downplaying right-wing violence. Even when you look at the, the FBI's own data sets about, you know, they, they used to do these reports about terrorism in America. And the way that they talk about right-wing violence is using terms like lone wolf, uh, single identity extremist, ways of minimizing and even neutralizing right-wing violence and setting the stage for ramping up this crackdown uh, on the left and on environmentalists. And so, you know, if there's one takeaway, I'm glad you brought this up kind of early in here, because um, the reason I focus so much on this issue is not just the civil liberties implications for the left, but the public safety implications for the entire country and arguably the world. I mean, we're seeing this come to a head. We saw it with January 6th. We're seeing it with the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Adam Waffen, the rise of, of a million different groups that have made very clear how eager they are to use assassination, violence, bombing, chemical warfare. Um, and the FBI needs to be held to account for this. I mean, frankly, I think if we had members of Congress that were uh, kind of worth a damn for a lack of a better description, there would be church committee style investigations into the FBI of how they allowed this rise of the far right to happen and how they justify going after uh, environmentalists and animal rights activists. You just mentioned Congress, which is actually exactly what I was thinking about when these right wing groups engage in this really violent, you know, behavior, they have cover, you know, through like it, you know, Trump and the MAGA people and the Republican Party. Whereas environmental groups who are just engaged in, you know, basic protest really don't seem to have any allies, you know, yeah. at, at that level, even the, the so-called squad or whatever, you know, you, you know, really can't do a whole lot. I mean, how much does that contribute to it where it's just like this kind of momentum and this this cowardice on 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 one part, you know, which kind of means that, you know, something minor that an environmental group does will get blown up. Whereas like these threats that are occurring every day against school boards and librarians and elective officials just kind of yeah. go on, you know, untouched. I, I think that's the heart of it right yeah. there. Uh, I would use the word cowardice as well. I think yeah. to round out that discussion a little bit more, um, I often talk about this idea of fragmentation, you know, when we're talking about political repression, that if we think of social movements, they really exist both uh, horizontally and vertically, right? So vertically, Within a movement, you have the above ground and the other underground. You have um, people leafleting, and then groups like the Earth Liberation Front—they're doing illegal things. Horizontally, the environmental movement 
probably to all of us, exists very closely linked to all these other uh, progressive social movements. When it's discussed in the halls of Congress or in the press or in the mouths of the FBI or these corporations, it's depicted as this kind of isolated extremist entity, right? So it's not part of the capital L left. It's not capital P progressive. It's this kind of weird something else. And animal rights activists are even more distanced in that way. And I think that gets to what you're, what you're exactly what you're talking about, that when you have that dynamic at play, and frankly, we're doing thing as, things as social movements that contribute to that and exacerbate it, it sets up a dynamic that um, when these things happen, it's easy to put your head in the sand and, and ignore it. Um, for instance, through, through all of these decades, one of the tactics used uh, by members of Congress and industry has been frankly uh, identical to the loyalty oaths of the 1950s and McCarthyism uh, of sending out actual letters to the big name nonprofit environmental groups and pressuring them to condemn the radicals, condemn even in name uh, what they're doing, even if you're not doing the same tactics. And so it's just created this climate of um, it's kind of a hair trigger, right? Nobody wants to get too close to it because you don't know what other replication, repercussions are going to be, um, you know, brought to life. You know, it's always, it's always interesting too that it, the, in the, in the right-wing media, you know, ecosystem echo chamber is that if you see, you know, I, I once watched a clip about some pro people who were protesting the Keystone Pipeline, and they were actually going to the homes of oil executives in, in Houston. And then Fox would run a segment on it and link it to the Sierra Club, right? Which is like the most mainstream white bread sort of uh, sort of uh, environmental nonprofit out there. But it's like this group, you know, Sierra Club supports these groups because they oppose Keystone. And it's it's actually interesting about how this plays out in the media and you know it's kind of a no-brainer that plays out in the conservative media but in, in a sense it also plays out in the in the sort of more mainstream and what we would call the liberal in the liberal media as well wouldn't you say oh without a doubt um i the, the hit pieces from the liberal media i think are like way more diabolical and 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 cutting than you ever see from from fox news or newsmax or whatever uh, without a doubt yeah man i've I've had some words with a lot of colleagues over this over the years, because I think a similar dynamic as what we talked about with the FBI is at play. Like there's not a thought about the nuance or the effects of the reporting. A lot of it is trying to show that you're the counterterrorism reporter, you're the national security. Like everybody's an expert on disinformation and right wing extremism as or, or whatever now. But these are the same journalists that are not actually trying to hold people in power accountable for what they're doing. And they're not doing actual investigative reporting into the right wing groups uh, and the people being labeled as terrorists. Uh, you know, it was mind blowing to me in the wake of uh, January 6th, there were all of these uh, reports coming out from that so-called liberal media talking about how the FBI needed more power to go after protest groups like this and that the domestic terrorism statutes were limited and i just I, man i got in some i didn't really keep the temper in a, a few of these conversations because i'm just like that's not even hard to disprove like it doesn't even take google searches like i don't even understand the quotes that you're using from these cabinet officials and whoever else like go to wikipedia i mean for god's sake like do something to try to start and to bring a critical perspective. Um, and I think a lot of it, I would even go to that point, Scott, of saying it is a little diabolical. Uh, it is a little, you know, trying to get some traction for your byline and get some clicks without trying to take on a complicated issue. I mean, it's easy to dogpile on groups that are being labeled as terrorists or extremists. I mean, it's easy to sensationalize that. Um, and I've had so many film crews and uh, TV shows and people internationally over the years, I'm sure you guys have too, that flock to it because it's, there's, you know, protest and terrorism and arson and all these things that we turn into this Hollywood version of the truth. Uh, and I think that's at the expense 
of telling the true story, uh, which is a little darker um, and probably just as sensational. You know, you mentioned the media, and, and again, this is mostly more just kind of impressionistic, but, you know, I remember the media, you know, kind of did a, a noble work exposing, you know, like DDT and yeah. celebrating Earth Day and, you know, the, the origins of the environmental movement and even up through the no nukes movement. But then, you know, it seems, and again, it may have been around 911 where it flips too. And even now, you know, in 2023, the world's fucking burning up. And they're writing these kind of equivalency articles in the New York Times and Washington Post, you know, like there may be global warming or there might be a climate change element to this. And, you know, is that another kind of does that contribute to it where they would start kind of promoting this surveillance or this repression of, of groups, um, you know, who are doing environmental work and creating this kind of and liberals like, you know, Scott pointed out, I mean, that's kind of the bane of our existence. We follow that because a lot of the right wing stuff is so over the top other than the true believers, you know, it's B.S., but liberal stuff is a little more sophisticated and, you know, you belong to a foundation that may have gotten, you know, money from somebody and all of a sudden, you know, boom. So as the media, what's the kind of the media, my short thing is what's the media's role in this and was there also kind of a, a heightening of their, their um, role in this too? Yeah, I, it's a, it's a tough question to answer because I think it brings in a lot of different elements. Um, you know, Ed Herman, when he wrote about this myth of the liberal media, was really talking about, you know, we can look at the content analysis of article by article or journalist by journalist and argue whether or not they skew a little bit to the left or not, but it ignores the structures that are in place that restrict the types of stories that are reported, how they're reported, the, the scope of analysis that's present, the voices that are there. Um, and not to mention the kind of career pathway and personal dynamics. I mentioned some of them, you know, myself that you come up against. One of the things that I, I really came uh, face to face with living and reporting in Washington, D.C. for over 20 years was how incestuous the relationships are between the so-called elite press corps and government, um, especially on broadcasts. Um, it's like a different animal. I hate that even broadcast journalism is still wrapped up with other reporting as if it's the same thing because it's it's not. Um, but those relationships cut to newspapers, bloggers, and everybody in between that you're spending a lot of time um, and you depend on certain types of people for access. And so when it comes to the point where you got to throw a punch and you got to publish something that those people that you're going to cocktail parties with or dating or um, you know otherwise depending on for your access are not going to like it brings in not just the structural issues of a, a capitalist run profit driven um, media enterprise or media system um, but the individual personal relationship as, as well so you know and there's a lot in between that um, I would argue that the press has probably been the primary contributor to this eco-terrorism hysteria since the 1980s, even more so than the FBI or some of these industry groups. Because, um, God, I mean, I just have files and files and files of these over the years of these hyper-sensational eco-terrorism stories um, that really miss the entire debate of how our civil liberties are being affected, how Scott, uh, you know, you mentioned the Oklahoma City bombing. A lot of these court cases we see with uh, Jessica Reznicek, we saw with Earth Liberation Front prisoners, with Marie Mason, with uh, Valve Turners, using the terrorism enhancement penalties. All of that came out of the Oklahoma City bombings, which were from right-wing groups, right? And so that context, I think, in this um, attention I don't even know what the word for it is. We're just in a race to the bottom in terms of our attention spans. And so for instance, when I was in DC, I got uh, headhunted by a new media outlet. And I was all excited about this. I thought it might be a good gig. They said they would let me write about whatever I wanted, however I wanted. And you know, we sat down and we had the coffee and the drinks and all this stuff. And it came down to it. And they're like, okay, you're going to be filing between five and six stories a day. And I was like, I'm an investigative journalist. I do, you know, it's probably one every six months is, is how I'm cranking things out. And that's just not the dynamic anymore, right? 
Um, you look at the, the few reporters that are left at both legacy and newer media outlets like The Intercept or whatever are cranking out a lot of volume and a lot of their reporting is kind of uh, like blogging. It's going based on what other people have already reported or published online. And maybe I'm old school, but I, we're never gonna get anywhere with that. It's just gonna be an endless echo chamber. And I think that's what we're seeing right now with the press and with uh, debates about right-wing extremism and uh, eco-terrorism. Even left media, I mean, Scott and I have been involved in this. They're now kind of uh, defending atomic power and they're defending private airplanes and they have no problem with, you know, kind of air conditioning and all these kinds of things. So even, you know, the so-called good side is, is you know, kind of has those problems too. Oh, without a doubt. And then yeah. it's depicted, you know, when you enter those spaces and you push back against it, um, as you all do, you know, you get a lot of different types of responses, but a lot of them is just trying to marginalize you and depict you as an extremist. That's that's you know, a, whether or not we get to this extent of terrorism labels and all that, um, it's still, oh, you're you're just a, you got to be a red or you're an environmentalist or a Marxist or something's coloring your view that is preventing you from understanding how reasonable uh, atomic power is to try to solve our electricity problem. Or, you know, you, you're, you're not down enough with the working class, you're more, you're more down with the middle class environmentalists when you oppose nuclear power, you know. Exactly. That, that kind of that kind of stuff, um, you know. Just to you know, to, to fast forward fast forward a little bit from the sort of green scare era, is you know we move into the 2010s and we have this sort of we have this uh, this renewed we have this movement which has this renewed energy energy around mostly like fairly tame direct action and and civil disobedience sort of being led by like the Bill McKibbins of the world. Mm -hmm. And and yet we still have we do have still have like edgy things going on in like backcountry like tree sits and things like that and that sort of culminates in like a mass mass you know almost uprising around Standing Rock, which which has now sort of triggered like a whole new slew of legislation uh, of anti protest bills and not quite calling it some of them some of the states call it terrorism but others are just making it a felony to protest or block traffic or make it legal for drivers to run into you. And and I'm and I'm wondering how you see that, and, and we're kind of in that current wave now. I would I would say we're really starting to we're really seeing that. And, and I was I have some cop, sit questions about cop city here in a minute, but like I'm just seeing how how do you see that sort of fitting into this? It's like the the, the McKibbins in the world sort of happened because in in part what their response is partially related to what happened with the Green Scare and with the ELF and things like that. But but still they're still being targeted. And I think you know, to speak in kind of a really broad strokes here about complex movements. I think that was a lot of the impetus behind this really massive shift towards those, you know, for lack of a better description, a little bit safer versions mm -hmm. of civil disobedience, the voluntary arrest, the showing up at the White House with your whole arrest plan figured out, laying down all that. Pre-negotiated. Pre -negotiated with the Pre-negotiating. Uh, get the photo, get out get arrested, you know, type of thing. Yeah. We saw, uh, you know, that juxtaposed with what happened at Standing Rock, where the weight and power of the state was rolled out very quickly and very violently. Um, it should be noted against marginalized and indigenous people, not just uh, the white wealthier donors at the White House that are, have their arrest plans figured out. And I think the kind of narrative that the environmental movement got sucked into in those moments was that, well, yeah, the green scare happened, the eco-terrorism crackdowns happened, but there's this belief that the activists brought it upon themselves in a way, right? They were too radical. Well, you know, we don't know how to talk about this, but the Earth Liberation Front, they did do arson, the Animal Liberation Front did do this, this, and this. And so I think there's a big push to reject that. And in doing so, thinking that that will protect you. What we see in the history of political repression in the United States and globally is that's absolutely never been the case, ever. There's never been a, a way to insulate yourself from political repression by choosing specific tactics. Um, the, the key marker here is whether or not those tactics start becoming effective. And when they start becoming effective, you start seeing the full weight of the FBI, private security, corporations, 
coming down on it. Um, whether that tactic is something that is seen as more militant or ma more mainstream, I think is completely irrelevant. The question is whether the tactic is moving the needle. And I, I, I don't know, I have a kind of a mixed analysis of those periods. I, I think we look at something with Standing Rock and we saw that, you know, there was a, a the massive outpouring and attention, people showing up, getting in front of the water cannons, getting in front of the police forces, um, having kind of inner movement solidarity. I think that's something that had to be clamped down on very quickly. Um, but that extends also to Charlottesville, right? Where you had literal neo-Nazis with their tiki torches and their khakis um, marching down the streets and you had a protester murdered, murdered, run over and murdered. And the response to that was a similar narrative, right? That the activists brought it upon themselves and what we really need are new laws that not only uh, protect the right, and silence dissent, but as you mentioned uh, in passing, there was a whole wave of state bills making it illegal, or making, excuse me, making it legal to run over protesters. Um, so I think we really have to break out of this mindset of these narratives and I think a mythology that we've been taught about social movements and particularly about nonviolence. Um, I think this is always kind of a touchy issue to talk about with activists in radical circles because people want to dig down their heels, whether based on their emotions and their beliefs about tactics. But in my experience, the reason I, I haven't um, come out firm for or against certain tactics or I've never condemned certain groups, even people I disagree with, because I think it completely misses the point. Um, and the point is, once we start actually getting the job done is when all of this apparatus is employed. And I think the more we ignore that, we're more we're going to be kicked on our ass and shocked when when this stuff actually happens. Um, like you mentioned with Cop City and anti-abortion activism and all kinds of different uh things right now. And and that increase in repression though kind of works, doesn't it? Because it kind of does scare a lot of people away. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard, you know, people who are would consider themselves environmentalists or liberals or whatever say, you're going too far. I agree mm -hmm. with your point, but they've gone too far, you know, and they kind of create this equivalency, like sitting in front of a bank and locking arms is the same as like, you know, burning out a, a, an island in Hawaii or, or whatever, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. And it's this idea that, um, well, you know, the, the narratives were taught kind of since grade school about the right way to protest. And that there is a, a socially accept, acceptable or even um, unoffensive way of protesting. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of the biggest coup right there is if you get people to start to believe that you can challenge state and corporate power in a polite way, that's not going to make a lot of people upset. I mean, they've kind of won the argument. Um, I think that discussion, though, I mean, we also need to think about this mentality that's been kind of internalized by social movements, that if we go about things using this set program, not only, as I mentioned before, we're not going to face political repression, but that actually could get somewhere. Um, so when I, when I try to raise these challenges like this, it's in the spirit of not just, you know, fighting back against the repression, but we have to do that in order to get to the point that's a bit further. And I think the way we talk about political repression and the fear that's created um, and the way we talk about radical groups is just shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, just to, just to switch to, to Cop City, uh, um, just to switch to Cop City, stop Cop City, actually is how I like to say it. You know, we, we mentioned Heather Heyer who was murdered by like a right winger in Charlottesville, but then we had this other, you know, and in some ways more, I don't want to say it's more significant, but it was, it was it's a, a definitely different course where we had the police actually murder an environmental protester, Torta Gita. And I'm, and I'm wondering if you see what's been happening in the Walani Forest and in Atlanta. And, you know, there's actually headway being made, like they're about to have to pass a referendum, you know, shooting down the funding for cops, for the cop city facility. But I'm wondering if you see that as a watershed moment, what we've seen in Atlanta, in the Walani Forest, around Cop City this year? 
I see it as a watershed in a lot of different ways, frankly. Yeah. Um, I think, well, one, uh, it reflects to me a turning point in the environmental movement, and using that word for lack of a better description, you know, we're loose, seeing loose, after, loose definition, environment loose definition. Environment. You know, this is a forest defense campaign, but it's also a, a criminal justice, anti-prison, police accountability campaign. It's also a community organizing uh, and health campaign. And so you have tree sitters and you have uh, protesters like Tortuguita and you have the the rubber bullets and the real bullets and all the things that you that have historically that I've seen repeatedly play out in the forest when you do an occupation like this. What's different is both the orientation of these movements, like how, how they're conceptualizing what they are and what they're trying to do. Um, the number of people that are being brought under the tent under a loose umbrella of stopping Cop City. I think it's unique in the tactics that they're drawing from. It's not just some of the more militant tactics or shack tactics. Um, it's also doing like the voter referendum, it's collecting signatures, it's doing free childcare. The real reason though that I, I'm watching Cop City in the campaign so closely is I think this is the barometer of what's gonna be coming down the pipe for a very long time. Um, you know, the, the reason I've kept with this issue for decades now is there are two things coming that I'm absolutely certain about, and they're frankly already here. One is this kind of neo-fascism, authoritarianism, state clampdown, restriction of civil liberties, the move to the far right, however we wanna talk about it. And the other is climate change or the impending uh, ecological crisis or ecological collapse. And when what's happening is those two things are gonna intersect and they're gonna intersect very quickly. Um, as we see people trying to cross borders and move more related to climate change, borders are gonna close. As we see debates and discussion and conflicts over water, protest campaigns are gonna intensify and with that, the repression is gonna intensify. And what has been shocking to me a little bit about Cop City, is how quickly we saw that stuff play out. I mean, with uh, Tortuguita being shot by police, not only was there a, a protester murdered, but it was shown uh, they had their hands up in the autopsy, right? Still, this narrative has just been lost. You know, it, like I, I've kind of thought about moments like this for so many years about what is this going to look like when the gloves start to truly come off, so to speak. And I've been pretty taken aback at how nonchalant and subtle and quiet the whole thing is. Um, most people don't know about this campaign. Most, the vast majority of people have no idea about environmentalists being shot in cold blood by the police. Um, people don't know that a bail fund, a friggin' bail fund that was raising money to defend protesters' First Amendment rights were themselves investigated and charged um, and demonized as terrorists. I mean, what's happening right now, it's escalating so quickly. Like I'm torn between wanting to emphasize that point um, and not wanting to scare people. Um, but I think we have to do a little bit of both and, and be honest about the scale of what's happening right now. I think it reflects the success and efficacy of these campaigns. Um, and it also, I think, shows what I said earlier, it doesn't matter the type of tactics you use. There are people collecting signatures for uh, ballot initiatives right now in the city council and the uh, government or Georgia Homeland Security is labeling those people as terrorists as well. You know, if, if you follow this, I'm sure you, as soon as Tortuguita was shot within six, 12 hours, the, the cop story was out all over the media. Yep. And if you follow this, you know, it was BS from the start, right? He shot first and this and that. But, you know, I think, you know, by the time the autopsy came out and that thing had unraveled, I think most people's minds were made up. Um, right now, I'm about 30 minutes away from East Palestine, Ohio, where nothing's been done. Absolutely nothing's been done. Trump has done more than Biden has, but let's I don't get started on that. But, uh, um, you know, a few days in, Aaron Brockovich, Hollywood celebrity basically comes in and the local law authorities put out this terrorism watch and started a terrorism yeah. task force for Aaron Brockovich, right? And it's just the way we use that word. I, I keep going back. Um, one of Bush's uh, aides, Matthew Dowd, who I think coined the axis of evil phrase, said, once we get them using our language, we've won. Mm 
And so when the left starts talking about terrorism and they're terrorists and they're terrorists, then pretty soon everybody's a terrorist, you know, and Aaron Brockovich is a terrorist. So, um, you know, that's that's hard to fight against. How do you get to these people, you know, who believe this and who think that, you know, both sides are equally wrong or something like that? Yeah, and I argue in the book and through my work that that's the very first step. Like if we were going to make a playbook of state repression, the first step is language, always, right? Uh, in this case, it was making up a new term, eco-terrorism, but there's always some manipulation of language, yeah. whether it's calling protesters outside agitators rather than local organizers, extremists, anarchists, whether or not they're anarchists, um, all that type of language. And I think it's the the power of it is it gets people to to shut down that little part of their brain that has the energy for critical inquiry right now, right? Um, when you mentioned Aaron Brockovich, I remember seeing that and just being like, the news cycle has shortened so immensely at this point that it used to be something like that. You could have some traction that people at least talked about for a little bit. It could be an entry point to maybe some lobbying or talking to members of Congress or something. And I don't know about you guys, but it just feels like now it's just this onslaught of terrible. And even when you have these flashpoints uh, of these kind of extremely shocking moments, um, we hit it and then move on. And we, as in the press, the left, uh, everyone. I mean, sometimes Fox or the far right will keep stuff going for a week or two if they really want to sink their teeth in. But I don't know what that reflects. Uh, and frankly, I like it. But it's five like, or six stories a, a day thing, right? Absolutely. And I, I get it. I mean, I've I've changed my news consumption. I'm a, yeah. I've been in journalism since I was 17. I don't read the news the same way. I don't use social media the same way. Um, I get it. it. It's just an onslaught. But man, it, it brings up some existential questions, mm. uh, certainly for people like us who work in academia or in journalism or in organizing what does it mean to be heard anymore um what are the possibilities of that i mean i've stood on so many stages at ted and all these places over the years and talked about sunlight as the disinfectant you know the first uh wave of attack has to be a kind of a war of information of, of educating the public and i don't know if that's true anymore um because I think we have the information and we see it and there's something happening like in our, our lizard brains that's very self-preservational um, that I think is kind of a, a systemic hopelessness that is happening right now or just an inability to cope. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's a mix of all these things that we see it. And like you said, you scroll through, you, you, you see six a day and then it's mm -hmm. like, okay. I'll go on to Instagram and look at something else. Right. Well, there's yeah. a the Washington Post had this guy who covered cops, Radley Balka, who was really good. Mm -hmm. And they got rid of him because they wanted more hot takes, not long stories. And I think that's kind of that's the media today, right? And so people, if you want to get that there, you have to start a sub stack or something like that. And people have to pay for it. And it's just hard to, unless you're Seymour Hirsch or somebody who's well known, that's real hard to get going. You're looking to get a few hundred people, maybe. And so they have that innate advantage. Right. And then even then you got to have, uh, you know, it's asking a lot of your audience. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I've got a pretty dark and depressing beat, man. Like, <laughs> I, I've, I've looked into all this stuff and I'm like, well, you know, you're asking people to subscribe and pay money to get more of that onslaught. And, yeah. and of course, there's value in it. But um, no, the, the lack of institutional support within the press right now is really scary. Um, because what's happening is all this critical analysis is being outsourced. And with that comes the risk. I mean, with people like uh, Balco, people like myself, like when you're when you're doing this type of work, you need structures in place that can support you. And if we're allowing everyone, well, just go have a sub stack yeah. or go start a YouTube channel, you might make some money, but you're not going to be very safe. Well, it's the, I mean, you have a certain podcast we'll have on these kind of pro-nuclear people calling themselves socialists and I mean, they're getting 100,000, you know, a million hits or whatever. And Scott and I don't, you know, we don't have that kind of infrastructure, that kind of money. And so it's very difficult to, you know, like, that's why we like talking to, to you and, and other folks like that, because um, a lot of people we talk to just don't get at, get into the media 
I mean, it's so much about gaming the system now. Yeah. Um, even in the traditional or legacy press, I yeah. mean, you have to game the system to think in, in sound bites to get even on the news cycle for that day and <laughs> to maybe get a tweet. Like I got, a, you know, you got a tweet from the Washington Post, you got a yeah. tweet from even Democracy Now or whatever, and then it's gone. Um, so how do we sustain that attention span um, in, in dark times? I think it's going to be a turning point for us. Yeah, it, it also seems that it's that the race to the bottom for the attention span and for the where your media is coming from and what your media is, is definitely also playing to the advantage for the ruling class. Like the, the less people are engaged, the, the more that people are, you know, have a short attention span, they're not actually able to focus on sort of challenging challenging the system or challenging the ruling class. I don't even go a step further, man. Because, you know, it used to be like when I was coming up, when everything was moving online, um, there was just this focus on, well, you use online sources. And so we're ignoring the entire body of human history that's not online, right? And I think we've crossed another threshold now that it, we have all this information online, but the only stuff we're able to get to is the sensational things that are in the recent news cycle or that have a YouTuber that has, you'll be shocked to learn about the benefits of atomic energy kind of shit, right? And so even if you're a journalist who's trying to do good work, you dig into that rabbit hole and it's just full of nonsense. Um, and people don't have the money or the budget or the skills to do real investigative work. And I think that's a pretty dangerous combination. Yeah. I, I uh, think we're close to the end, but oh. Yeah. I ahead. have one more question, but I if just you have, have one more. <laughs> well, I was just, it, it may be close to, I just, this is more kind of an impressionistic, like I'm, I'm pretty bleak right now. Like I just kind of close to throwing up my hands and saying, what's the fucking point? But uh, I mean, and you're kind of on the front lines far more than, than we are. Um, what, what, do you see anything coming out of this? I mean, it just seems like every day, you know, in, in Florida, you're not allowed to use the words climate change and people are getting arrested. You know, like, like Scott said, we've talked to Jake uh, many times. He's a good friend of us, uh, of, the, of the podcast. Like, uh, and I'm just very bleak. I mean, I just like people who you think would know better kind of buy into a lot of these narratives. They're going too far, blah, blah, blah. Like what, where do you see us headed? I'm in the same space. Yeah, you know, I've been a lot more open in recent years talking about depression and PTSD yeah. and kind of why I've changed my work. And a lot of it's because of that, you know, to, to be candid, I shifted and started going into the archives a lot at universities looking for some of these answers of how did people in what I see as these other turning point moments in, in human history, whether it's the rise of the Third Reich, Spanish Civil War, resistance movements all over the world that were getting the true boot on the throat. Um, what do they do? You know, what lessons does that have? And what I found was uh, a mix of things. Um, for instance, I learned that at that time, like with the rise of the Third Reich, most journalists, most news outlets, like nearly all of them were praising Hitler and praising what was happening in Germany, even as things were escalating. Um, and then I was going further into the kind of personal stories of journalists and individual activists and artists. And you see the same thing happening again and again when it's um, the crowd is never going to get it until it's kind of already here. And perhaps it might be a little bit too late. You know, I don't want to be too bleak in saying that, but I think we got to acknowledge that if we're looking for a crowd, for a mass to suddenly be like, we're going to stop fascism and ecological collapse before it happens. I don't know. Uh, what I do think, though, or at all of those moments, there have been small groups of individuals who have punched way outside of their weight classes in terms of what they've been able to get done. And I don't know, I, I think there's a little bit of, of hopelessness in that type of analysis uh, of thinking about what our social dynamics are right now. And I also feel power in it, too, because it makes me want to be drawn closer to people like you all who are immersed in this to activists like Jake who have been on the front lines for decades, rather than trying to think that we're gonna have some big turning point moment, I think we're gonna have a lot of little turning points along the way. Um, some of them might be significant and some might not, but it, it really is gonna start speaking to, you know, not to get biblical or philosophical with it, but 
what is the nature of being a human being? What does it mean to struggle? What does it mean to be alive? Um, and how do we remove that from the end point that we're trying to get to? What happens if we're never able to, to get to that end point? And I think that's the kind of discussion I'm really interested in right now. How do we keep going? How do we keep fighting, acknowledging darkness, and at the same time, recognizing that we can't change who we are and this fight that's within us and outside of us isn't going to go away? My, my question, and this is maybe a hot take question, sure. um, and maybe not a hot take question, um, just like my sort of final wrap up question is, um, you know, we've, we've talked a bunch about the media, the other the other interesting thing that the other thing that we're interested in, and we've talked about actually on the podcast a number of times is around pop culture. And we like recently had on Daniel Goldhaber, who's the director of how to blow up a pipeline. And I'm actually reading this novel, a cli fi novel called The Deluge, which actually has an eco terror cell or eco terror cell that's blowing up pipelines that leads to like federal let you know crackdown legislation. Um, but I'm wondering if you how you see like popular culture sort of like fitting in fitting into this. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Um, I wrote an article for a journal a while back, years before how to blow up a pipeline and all this stuff about kind of the need I feel we have to fictionalize things that are kind of too big or too dark for us to accept the nonfiction version, right? And that's been a little bit of a hard lesson for me as a journalist, as a nonfiction person all these years. Um, I mentioned this kind of faith in the facts, faith in the truth. And I'm starting to feel like the criticism I've had for that might be a little bit misguided. I think there's a lot of value in fictionalizing some of these things that take place because it puts us in a different headspace and a different arena where we're able to think and talk differently um, without being quite so invested in the facts of what's happening. Um, so where I'm at right now in, in terms of thinking about this is kind of a deep dive for a new book I'm working on into storytelling and mythology. Um, I think what the decisions that we make and how we think as humans are a lot more shaped by kind of primal and archetypal narratives of struggle and change and um, what it means to be an American and nationalism, all of these things that hit us at a very subconscious level. And you have pop culture that's often exploited to tap into that narrative that we already know. And then you can also have pop culture narratives that tap into it and try to twist it a little bit. Um, if that makes sense. And so I think that's where we need to, to try to get to is acknowledge like we all have these same stories we've been fed our entire lives about why we need police, why we need uh, animal agriculture, why we need atomic power, um, the nature of the government protecting us. And I think there's real opportunities in fiction and, and even within pop culture to push people outside of that a little bit. Um, to imagine different alternatives, whether we're talking about like dystopian or science fiction um, or thinking about alternate realities, alternate um, depictions of what's happening right now. Um, we can't give up on story. I mean, the right wing has it on lock right now. Yeah. They've got it on lock. And what I try to tell people all the time is this is our domain. This is our shit. The, the artists and the weirdos and the writers and the protesters, we're the ones that deal in story. Like we can imagine something better to replace this late stage capitalism that we're in. The far right is never gonna imagine a better story than we are. They're just gonna re keep repeating the same stories that we've always been told until it kills yeah. us. Yeah. Um, we, should, we should probably drop, but Will, it's been great having you on. Actually, it'd be great to have you on again. We'd love to kind of continue these oh, conversations. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Uh, Anytime. Yeah, it's, great. it's great talking to you guys. It makes me feel much less crazy and isolated and all alone. So, yeah, cause, cause, cause we're selfishly, so optimistic. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's we, why we, we see the world that. through rose colored glasses. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> uh, folks, you've been listening to Will Potter, investigative journalist and author, author of Green is the New Red. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're listening to this on one of the many audio pod pod podcast platforms we're on, give us a rate and a review. And if you really like us, check it out. Check us out at greenandredpodcast.org and hit that support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenandred.
green red podcast of talking too fast uh and everyone else also just go out and misbehave and make trouble and because that's what we like to do we'll talk to you again soon keep saying joe mccarthy you want to do that then i just want to Can't really sure what the goddamn time is.